Hello and welcome to Katrina's Creations. This is the Wednesday edition and today we are going to be talking about antique blankets, coverlets, quilts, and a not so antique but it looks antique comforter that my mother made. So before I get started, uh, before I show each item, I will tell you a little bit about the history of it um, before I show it. So that way, and a little bit of history about the type of item that it is. So let's get started. I will start with the oldest item. Well, I think is the oldest item. There's two. I'm not sure which one is the oldest. Uh, to my knowledge, the oldest one is a quilt that you're going to see. And it's a geometric quilt. So it means that it's, it's not a crazy quilt or a crumb quilt, uh, but it's actual squares. It's made up of squares and triangles. Now, the the, uh, the quilt was made by my great-grandmother for my grandmother, and it was made out of her childhood dresses. Now, my grandmother was born in 1909, so um, I'm guessing that this was probably put together somewhere in the period of, you know, the 19-teens into the early 1920s. And the interesting thing with this fabric is when you think of a little girl, you think mostly of um, patterned dresses and things like that, like today with cottons and things, and even old pictures. Uh, if you look at them, a lot of people were wearing flowers or plaids and things like that. This one, there's only a couple of patterns in the, um, in the quilt itself. Most of it is solid colors, and most of it is, um, they almost feel like they're flannel. They're kind of fuzzy. They're not cotton. And the only thing I can think with that is that my grandmother grew up in Colorado and it was of course cold where she lived. Uh, they lived in Berthoud and so I think that might be um, maybe why uh, my grandfather or well, my great grandfather was a blacksmith and um, he, she had, she was like the youngest um, of her brothers and sisters. There was I believe three or four sisters and she was kind of a surprise to the family because they were all a lot older. Some of them were even out of the house when she was born. So, um, yeah, so she was the, she was their youngest child and she was very much, you know, like the kid's sister. So now the history of quilting, um, the very first, they know that they go back thousands of years, but the oldest one that they actually still have is from 1360 um, and it's called the Tristan quilt and it's in Sicily, Italy. Um, but quilting itself they know dates back to at least 3400 BC. Quilts with embroidery um, on them with memorial things they would have um, usually some kind of a poem or something like that. Um, they were called Baltimore album quilts and I live, well, I grew up in, in Maryland. So um, when I say Baltimore, it's Baltimore, Maryland is what they're talking about. But they're known as Baltimore album quilts and they were very um, characteristic to that area. So um, you don't see them other places. If you do, they probably originated from Baltimore. Um, in, the in the 1830s, uh, with the early abolitionist movement, uh, women made quilts usually with um, embroidery on them with anti-slavery sentiments, um, with uh, poems and things like that embroidered onto the poems. They were sold at fairs to raise ab uh, to raise money for the abolition uh, movement. During the Civil War, the North continued to make these quilts, and they also made them for soldiers and for the war effort in general. In the South, they made what were called gunboat quilts, where it was the same thing, where women were making quilts and selling them because they were trying to raise money for gunboats. So they're referred to as gunboat quilts. Now there are crazy quilts, also known as crumb quilts. Those um, were in the latter years of the 1800s, like the 1890s into the early 1900s. Those were very popular. And they usually, when I say crazy quilt, they were not a geometric pattern. They were all different types of shapes put together, almost like a puzzle piece. And the pieces were joined 
normally when you quilt you join so the seams don't show where you've seamed them together. These were actually joined with seams in the back but the front had like uh, fancy stitching done right along the seams like a turkey turkey foot I think it's turkey foot stitch something like that uh, but they were done and they were very elaborate. My mother used to have one of those that was made from one of her aunts, would be my grandmother's sister's, party dresses. Now my daughter and I both remember seeing this dress, seeing this quilt, and my mother told us about it, and I remember seeing it when I was a child. Um, it was all done in like satins because my aunts, well great aunts, would have been like in the flapper period in the 1920s. In fact, we used to have a flapper dress around the house that was one of my great ants. But um, they're kind of like a satiny taffeta type of, of material. And the crazy quilt that I remember seeing just had the top. It wasn't completed. My, gra my great grandmother had never finished it. Um, but we can't find it anymore. So I'm not sure my mother couldn't find it. We don't know what's happened to it. Um, if it got lost in one of our, in one of their moves or... The oldest patchwork quilts date to 1718 uh, in Wilshire, England. And also in 1726, there is one in Quebec, up in Canada. So um, that is a short little brief history of the quilts. And now I will show you what the quilt that I'm talking about looks like. This is the quilt that was made by my great-grandmother. And as you can see, it is mostly uh, solid colors. There along the edges are the only part where there is some pattern which is right here. And there's not a whole lot of quilting that went on. Let me move this down a little closer so you can see it. There's no like quilting on any of this. It's just simply been overstitched where it was pieced together. So it was pieced together, then she just ran a sewing machine around the edges and it was done by machine. I can tell that just by looking at it. And it's interesting, right here, you'll see a seam where she actually had to piece some of the material together in order to get the square. And then she's just tufted on the edges at different places. And there's another one here where she's actually had to um, seam them together to make it work. But overall, it is solid colors in this um, kind of uh, turquoise and a denim blue. And then there's this patterned, which is, it feels like flannel. It really does. All of this feels like a brushed flannel. And then there's this kind of rust color here. And then a cream. And the cream does have a slight pattern to it. It almost reminds me of a tablecloth. Oh, and there's a pink. There's a kind of a pinky salmon color. Um, but this color here has, you won't be able to see it on the camera, but it almost has like an embossing on it, like what you'd see on a tablecloth. Let me flip it over so you can see what the back side looks like. The back looks like it was done almost with mattress ticking. It's not like traditional blue and white mattress ticking, but it is a denim and blue. And it doesn't show up well because it's very faded, but there's, you can see little like dashes of a kind of a salmon -y, what might have been a salmon -y color at one time. So, and it is fairly puffy inside uh, because this was not quilted a whole lot. There was not any like top quilting that really went on. So that is my grandmother's quilt when she was a child. And it would probably fit the top of a single sized bed but there's not enough of it to hang down. So it's about maybe four feet across and maybe about six feet long. Okay, I just discovered it has a hole in it right here. And um, you can actually see inside and see the batting. And you can see the batting right here. And it is not like any kind of polyester. It feels like it's a type of a wool type of batting. Of course, when it, this was made, there was not the synthetics that we have today. But yeah, you can see the batting inside here where it's ripped. Now the next item 
is from my husband's family. I'm not sure who made it or how old it is. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the early to early 1900s to 1930, somewhere in that time period. And it is a coverlet. Now it is woven on a four harness loom and it's a cotton. Now they lived in North Carolina outside of the town of Denton, which is Davidson County, North Carolina. And many of them worked in the hosiery mills, which were very, very um, popular down there. Uh, they've since, a lot of those have closed down, but um, in the early to mid 1900s, a lot of my husband's relatives were working there. So the the quilt or the coverlet itself, like I said, it's cotton, so it's not a heavy material uh, because where they lived, it, it doesn't get overly cold. They might have a couple of cold days, but not that many. And they were farmers, and my father-in-law, when he gave me this coverlet, rem remembered seeing a loom. He lived with his grandparents uh, for the first eight years of his life. And um, upstairs in the attic was where he slept. There was a couple of rooms up in the, the attic portion of the house. And he said he remembered seeing a floor loom up there. Now he told me that the cotton was grown on the property and spun on the property and then woven. I'm not real sure about that. Um, the cotton very possibly because they, they did have, um, you know, they do have, a, they are on a farm. They could very well could have been growing cotton. Um, but the spinning itself is so even, usually even an experienced hand spinner, you're going to have some slops in it somewhere. Um, this this looks machine spun to me. It just looks a little too even. Cotton is very thin, um, short fiber. So when you spin it, as opposed to wool, where you can spin it at lower speeds, cotton has to be spun at a higher rate of speed to get enough twist so that all those little teeny fibers get incorporated. It's very hard to do it evenly. Um, this to me, like I said, it looks commercial. I have no way of knowing. I do know it was probably woven at home. I had a lady look at it one time who um, was a weaver herself and she told me it was done on a four harness loom and she spotted a mistake in it where the weaving, the weaver had gotten off. Um, I haven't noticed it because I really haven't looked all that close. But the one thing you will notice with this coverlet, it's got a lot of tears in it. My father-in-law originally gave it to me thinking I could um, you know, like you could use darning needles and fix socks. He was thinking I'd be able to darn it back together again. And if it had been one tear or a small tear, but there's quite a few tears all the way around it. I'm not sure how that happened. I mean, it was like that when it was given to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know any more about the history of it. My father-in-law's gone, so I can't really ask him. But I thought I would tell you a little bit about looms and the loom weaving. I mean, you've seen, if you've missed the tutorial I did on weaving, um, you can click the little eye up here and it'll take you to a playlist where I talk about weaving. Um, but floor looms on average are about, they weave a section about three feet wide. They're, a floor loom is about the size of a piano and sometimes a little bit deeper. They have to be um, deep enough from like where you're sitting to the back, they have to be wide enough or deep enough that way to be able to get enough space to run the shuttles back and forth. Um, it's not like my small tabletop loom, which is only about two and a half feet deep. They have to be at least four to six feet deep in order to really get a, a good weaving area. So the floor loom was developed in 1801, but there were looms before that. They were upright looms. Um, a lot of your tap tapestries in castles and things like that, the medieval tapestries and things, a lot of those were done on upright looms. But the actual power loom um, was developed in 1784. And once they developed the ability to push pedals to lift up the harnesses, um, it made the work go much faster. Like my loom does not have a floor pedal. So every time I raise a harness, I have to stop what I'm doing and lift lift a lever up to make it work. Um, where if it's pedals on the floor, you don't have to take your hands off of your work. So doing that made it much, much faster. 
Also in 1801, the first punch cards were developed. Um, you think of the punch cards like from the 1960s and 70s. They look very similar to that. Um, they were actually, their cards about this big and they're left lengthwise and they lace them together and they literally rotate around and as they punch through, sort of like how a, a music box works where the cylinder rotates and it tells, um, it you know, it plays the music. A, um, a punch card loom actually as that car, as that series of cards rotate around it tells which harnesses to raise and so that's when they could start doing the jacquard what's called jacquard print uh, which is more more detailed a lot of times there's a there's a design on one side and a different design on the bottom or they might be reversed from each other and those are things that were developed once they were able to do these more intricate things on the looms it was developed by a man named Joseph Jacquard, which of course is why it's called a Jacquard coverlet when you see things like that. In 1818, looms were adapted for manufacturing. There were 32 factories in England with a total of 5,732 looms. That means there were over 200 per building. Uh, years ago, my husband and I went up to Lowell, Massachusetts which was a, and still is, a weaving area. You can go in. It's part of the National Park Service. And we went into one of the buildings, and it used to be a huge, huge complex. I think it operated, I think it operated till the 1970s or 80s, maybe. Uh, but they had, of course, electric-powered looms. We walked into a room. There was, I believe, 60 to 70 looms. We had to put earplugs in, and they were only running two of them. They said they could not run all of them at once to demonstrate because the noise and the vibration it caused from the shuttles flying back and forth was actually sh um, affecting and shaking the foundation of a brick building. So, and you could hear those two looms running. We were up on the third floor and you could hear them running all the way up there. So I can't imagine being a worker back then and the noise that they were experiencing you know so, so it's no wonder so many of them were deaf because even with the earplugs in it was very very loud so um that is a little bit about the um coverlet that i know of and the weaving techniques behind it so let me pause and show you what it looks like now this is the comforter this is just where it's been folded and creased over the years uh, but let me lower this so you can get a little bit closer view of the weaving itself. Here you can see a lot better. It's kind of a honeycomb weave. And the tears I was talking about, there are quite a few of them, but they're actually this direction. And they're, they're pretty bad tears. They're, they're also frayed. So I'm probably not going to do anything with it. Now the back of this, you can see right where it was seamed. You can see some of the seam needs to be redone here. But this is the seam that's right here. And it looks like it was just um, whip stitched. It looks like it was just whip stitched. In fact, you can see here is portions where they where these little holes are, where they tied it off, but they didn't, um, they didn't get that into the seam, so it actually ends up showing. It doesn't show, well, it shows a little bit on the front, and that shows a little bit on the front here, too. The overall size of this, I would say, is probably seven feet by about seven feet. Um, you can see there's a pattern that kind of changes. You can see it has like a border right in here. Um, and then it has a solid section here. Well, it's just textured. And then it repeats those small sections again. So you can see it here, and then there's a solid section. And over here. And it does that all the way across. And I do notice the area that where there's mistakes made. You can see some spots. You can see some spots right in here where they actually missed. It should have been an open weave and they, they went straight across. 
so you can see some spots where some mistakes were made. So I do tend to believe this was probably woven at home. Just looking at the way the seams were done, they were not um, sewn on a sewing machine. They were sewn by hand. Um, but other than the tears, it's held up pretty well. It's not yellowed or anything. As you can see, it's still the kind of off-white that it's always been. But this is the coverlet. The next item I'm going to talk about is, I believe, from the 1930s. Um, my mother gave this to me. It's a wool blanket. At least I believe it's wool. Um, it is a woven blanket. It was. It's commercially produced. She said she remembered it as a child. Now, my mother was born in 1940, so she just turned 80. Uh, she remembers it as a child, and she said it used to have, I, I think she said orange binding, like the silk blanket binding on it, and she says that came off years ago. So the very first blankets were made of wool, and they originated in 1340 by a man named Thomas Blanket. Now you know where blanket, the term blanket came from. It's spelled a little different. I'll put it down here how he actually spelled it. Uh, he was a Flemish weaver, and he developed a heavily napped weave which is what our blankets are today. They are, they are woven and there's a fuzz to them. There's a nap on the top and that's kind of what makes them warm. So the blanket that, that I have, I've looked at pictures from blankets from the 1940s. Like I said, my mother was born in 1940. She remembers it as a child. So I know it dates at least to the 1940s. Uh, whether it was before that, um, I'm not sure. But the the fibers that were available in the 1940s would have been viscose, rayon, nylon, and hemp, as well as wool. Now the pictures that I've looked, I've looked over on eBay, I've looked on some antique blanket sites, and the blanket that my, my mother has to me looks similar to the 1940s blankets that were made of wool. Um, although she said that she's thrown it in the wash and used it for years. But just the fact that it is held up as long as it has, I'm tending to think that it is actually has wool in it. At least portion of it has wool in it. So um, that is what I know about it. Like I said, she doesn't know exactly how old it is. So I'm going to show you a picture of that and get a little close up in here for you. This is the 1940s blanket. It's very soft. Um, I do believe it has wool in it, but it almost feels like there is some kind of a synthetic in it as well. And this also, sadly, has a hole in it. So let me take this down and you can see it. Right here, it looks almost like um, somebody's tried to mend it at some point. You can see there was apparently a patch on it. Um, I can still see the stitching that's loose right in here. And you can see where somebody tried to fix this at some point. Um, it is really, really soft. I can understand why my mom liked this blanket as a child. Um, it's kind of a pinky, pink, kind of a pinky, dusty rose color, and a lighter, kind of an accru color. And it would probably fit a full-size bed, but not hang over a whole lot. But it is extremely soft, which tells me that there's, there is probably some kind of acrylic in it. But the overall pattern is that of a 1940s. Uh, wool blanket and as my mother said at one time it had binding on the edges but as you can see it doesn't anymore but it is really really soft and it is a woven blanket you can see some of the weaving in here but um, and it has like a fuzzy nap to it so it is really really soft so that is my mother's blanket from her childhood. Now the last item I'm going to talk about um, is something near and dear to my heart because my mother made this and my mom has a Bernina sewing machine which can do embroidery. Um, it's computerized and she made this quilt. The top of it is a satin but she did it in sepia tone so it looks like it's old. Um, and it, it just gives it an antique look. And then she took her computerized sewing machine and did a doily. I mean, you could actually do it on a, on a fabric and peel the fabric away 
and you would have a doily. That's how fancy the sewing machine is. But she did it on the quilt itself, and each one of the doilies is slightly different. So um, when she first made it and I saw it, I told her, I said, one day, please put it someplace, a note on it somewhere or whatever, that I get that one day. Because I just think it's really, really pretty, and I would love to have that one day, um, you know, as something that you've made. Um, so, you know, and she knows I like, you know, like crocheting and knitting and stuff. So, and I do have some needlepoint that my, that my mother's mother made. And, um, I have some crochet that my grandmother made, my other grandmother, my dad's mom made. So, um, I have some doilies that she made. So it's like, I would love to just continue with the tradition and have something that my mom made. So, um, she gave it to me the other day because she said, well, it's been sitting up in a closet in a box, not being used, and it's meant for like a double to a queen size. I think it's meant for a queen size bed, and they have a king size bed now, and she was afraid of the dog pawing it, and it's snagging, so it's been sitting in a box, and it doesn't fit a king size bed. Well, we also have a king size bed too, but up here where I'm filming, which on the other side, like, on this side of the room, this is a spare bedroom for our house. And it's a full-size bed. So I'm actually going to be putting the quilt up here on this bed. <laughs> Except when company comes, then it's coming back off again. Um, but my mom just said, you know, it's been sitting in a box and it's not getting used. So I would rather pass it to you now so you can actually enjoy it and use it. So, um, yeah. And she gave me some curtains that kind of match it too. So... Yeah, so anyway, with that, I will show you the quilt that she made for me, or the comforter. I keep calling it a quilt. It's technically a comforter because it's squishy inside. So let's take a look at it together. Now here is the quilt that my mother made, or the comforter, and I'm trying to give you a high shot of it so you can see it well. And then I'll drop it down so you can we can talk a little bit about it. So now I'm going to show you each of the doilies because there's uh, a corner doily and there's three or there's a corner doily and then there's three quilted doilies in between each all the way around. So again this is the center section here and it has these little umbrellas and these little thingies here and each corner of the center section has a little potted flower and that same potted flower is over in the far corners of each of the edge of the quilt. So there is the corner and all four corners look the same and again they have the little umbrella motif. We have this one, and this one, and the third one, and then coming down the side we have this one, and then this one. And then this one. Now remember, these were all done by machine. And the bottom, we have this motif. has bat like baskets on it. Then we have this motif, which was also at the top center right there. And then we have a different motif on this end here, and it has hearts. And then on the final side, we have this one, and this one, and 
this one. So all of the stitching is done in shades of like uh, light tans and the satin is done in shades of like a cream and an ivory. So it is very vintage looking even though it's only probably about 15 years old. So I hope you've kind of enjoyed this little walk down memory lane with fiber. And if you stay tuned tomorrow, I'm just doing something a little different since I'm off work. I thought it'd be kind of fun to do, you know, what am I doing with my crafting and my self-isolation? So um, yeah, we're all in this together. And so I thought I would really be honest with you guys and show you what things look like around my house. Because um, right now, frankly, it's a mess. Um, yeah, I've got stuff everywhere, but when I finish this video, I'm going to go get it cleaned up. So, but you will see it before I touched the mess. Um, I clean up and then it turns into a disaster again when I start working on things. So yes, my crafting has run amok this past couple of weeks with nothing to do but sit at home. So yes, lots of projects have been going on. It's like I work on one for a little bit, then I get bored and I have to go find something else to do. And in between all that, I'm trying to clean, which explains some of the mess that's all over the place. Anyway, so stay tuned tomorrow to check out that with me as well. It's going to be my cyber fiber vlog. So yeah, that will be tomorrow. So thanks again for watching and I will see you tomorrow. And then again, of course, on Saturday. Bye everybody.